Welcome, everyone. We're going to begin this study with a word of prayer. <clears throat> the dear Father in heaven, we ask that you can be with us now as we study together this morning. We thank you for this new week. And we are thankful for uh, the trials and the things that you teach us. We ask for your spirit's presence in our lives and that uh, the work that you have begun in us, that you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. We pray for understanding. We pray for uh, those who are studying and searching for truth. And we pray also, Lord, for those that uh, are struggling um, to understand truth for various reasons. We just ask that we can be an influence to help them. And that as we look at uh, David H. Steele's uh, paper, that we pray for him, that you can be with him. And uh, help us, Lord, to understand things correctly. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just a, a quick review. So we've been... Uh, Hi again, everyone. So we've been going through this paper by David H. Steele. Now, I've had some communication with him on on Facebook Messenger, and you know, and he's accusing me of slander, and you know, he's he's quite belligerent. So I guess you know, I mean, I could go through and read everything that he's written and everything that I've written, which I I, I can't for the life of me figure out how I'm slandering him. Uh, especially by going through his papers so carefully. But the basic thing is he has this belief that Ellen White's endorsement of the book on thoughts on Daniel and thoughts on Revelation means that we need to accept Uriah Smith's view on Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45. Now, is that reasonable? Right. That's one of the things we want to look at. We want to look at what Ellen White's, White's endorsements mean. Right. So we've, we've gone through these um, uh, principles of prophetic interpretation. Uh, that's where the page that we're on right now. So how do we deal with this problem of Ellen White's endorsement? So he, he's gone through this thing about and we'll probably read a little bit of this as well. And, and we're going to look in more detail on other things that she's endorsed. Uh, the one that I think of the most is basically. Now, she doesn't say Samuel Snow's, you know, August 22nd, uh, the true midnight cry paper is, you know, uh, truth and everyone should read it or anything like that. But she talks about the midnight cry that it was given, right, that it was from God. And we have, you know, Samuel Snow's what he wrote. And we know that she doesn't agree with all the details of what Samuel Snow wrote. So how do we take an endorsement like this? And any thoughts on that before we get into it? I mean, we will look at it. Maybe, you know, people have better ways of expressing themselves about it. But Well, I would say if she was endorsing, in particular, Daniel 11, verses 36 to 45, that would be a contradiction to what she says in Manuscript Releases, chapter 13 where she talks about the rest of that chapter is we're soon to, to, to finish, chapter 11, Daniel 11. Yeah. And then she quotes verses 30 to 36 and saying that history will be repeated. Yeah. And so that's in the context of what's to come and the fulfillment of the rest of Daniel, chapter 11. So if he's just going to take that statement of... Uh, um, endorsing uh, the books of Daniel Revelation and it would contradict what she says about what she, well, the what she says about verses and how she looks at yeah how she looks at those verses yes yeah, uh, yeah, so at the end of Daniel chapter eleven and so forth to me it, um, there's a, an antithesis there between his understanding and what yeah. Ellen White says that to do he doesn't seem to be taking on board what Ellen White says in the manuscript releases. Yeah. And, and, and we know that, you know, like there are times I've endorsed books. I say, you know, this is a must read Adventist book. Um, for instance, uh, 
uh, The Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection by E.T. Jones. I think every Seventh-day Adventist should read that book. But he has the new view of the daily in it. So does that mean when I endorse that book as a book that every Seventh-day Adventist must read, that I'm endorsing his view on the new view of the daily? No. No, right? Because it's the other things that he says that that, you know, I want people to read what he says about the nature of Christ and overcoming sin and so forth. But sometimes I, I will give a caveat regarding, you know, his view on the new view of the daily, but it's not a major part of the book. Right. Um, now, also, Ellen White does make some comments about uh, Uriah Smith, and we're going to run into those about uh, when he was presenting on the Eastern question. And, and you can see by Ellen White's statements that she's not endorsing and saying that his views on the Eastern question are correct. She just says basically, you know, that it's created some interest, right? And that people are, you know, interested in it. And then, but a, a person would bring, you know, if it's error, you know, shouldn't she point it out? I, and, I look at it, it's yeah. pretty pretty simple in, in, in one way in that uh, to Interpret the spirit of prophecy, use the same principle as interpreting the Bible. We take together all the verses or all the statements mm -hmm. in spirit of prophecy, all the verses in the Bible, and then, then make a decision. Yeah. Now, we do have, you know, some areas in which we have to really think this through. For instance, you know, some people will make the same type of arguments we're making right now about Uriah Smith's um, thoughts on Daniel in regard to uh, early writings, page 74, where Ellen White says uh, that they were all agreed upon the, the, the true view of the daily or the correct view of the daily. And, and people will say, well, you know, we need to take everything into, into context. And that's not really an endorsement of everything that they said about the daily etc right and, and there's a truth to that i mean obviously there were parts of what the pioneers understood that were only partial and you know especially since they didn't fully understand christ's heavenly ministry um and the sanctuary truth that there is is things that we would have to look at in regard to the pioneer view on the daily and refine some things Right. And, and even how they understood some of the verses, you know, what it, what it meant to take away. The one means lift up and exalt. The other one means, you know, you got room and uh, uh, sir. Right. You got these two different words, both translated as take away. So Ellen White is not wanting us to stop studying just because she makes a statement about a book or a teaching, there is more light to come. But new light never undoes old light. It's not a contradiction to old light, but it's an unfolding of old light. Now, you know, getting back to David H. Thiel and what he's saying about me slandering, and I'm trying to try to figure out what it is. I've even asked him, like, can you point out where I'm actually slandering you? Because I so said, I don't even know you. I don't know anything about your character. Like he says, in, what was the words he used? Um, attack me and my character in such an unchristlike manner. Well, did I attack him or his character? Now, when you're dealing with something that somebody believes and you're saying they're wrong, maybe he takes that as an attack upon his character. That's an emotional, personal attachment to a belief. Yeah. Okay, so, like, if somebody disagrees with me, I would never take it as an attack upon my character, right? You know, if they if they say, well, your reasoning here is wrong and here's why, well, then that's, that's fair, right? But if they say, you know, uh, you know you're a liar um, and you're dishonest, well, th that would be an attack upon my character. Wouldn't really bother me. But, you know, uh, I would realize that that person isn't actually addressing 
the argument that I'm making. They're just trying to either hurt my feelings or dismiss what I'm saying um, so that they don't have to deal with it by, you know, uh, characterizing me as somebody, you know, not worthy uh, to discuss with, right? Now, I would ask, I would ask them where I was lying, at least point it out. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Which, which, which I do with people, you know, when people, you know, they, now the thing is, all I can say with, with uh, David H. Steele here is, you know, right from the beginning, he accuses me of, uh, first he says that I think I'm infallible because I disagree with him, right? Like, like I'm not sure how, how somebody having a different view uh, I mean, do we think we're infall infallible because we think something different than someone else? Never presented myself as infallible. I don't think I'm infallible. In fact, I know I'm not. I know I make lots of mistakes and constantly learning. So, so you know, I, I can't think of anything that I've said or done. Like, I do say, you know, like one of the things he, I said that, you know, he's, he's taking the opinion of, uh, Willie White and um, and and Arthur Arthur White White's opinion about stuff that happened in the past. And he says it's not opinion; it's historical facts. Well, it's hearsay to say what Ellen White thought about something based upon you know past history when Ellen White herself never says anything about it. That would be hearsay, wouldn't it? They have opinions about things that happened in the past. If she didn't, if she didn't said it, she didn't <laughs> actually say it, then don't believe it. Yeah, like people will say, you know, Ellen White thought this, or she did this for this reason, or James White did this for this reason. You know, even if it's, even if it was my children who, who said something about me, about what I actually thought about something or why I did something or what my motives were. But one thing I can tell you quite clearly, they probably don't know, right? Because even my children have a narrative or a framework in which they assess uh, me as a person, which isn't necessarily correct. You know, my children don't really understand me, my motives or my actions or why I did what I did. Um, just as I didn't really understand my dad until, and even much later, I understand much more as time went on. As I got older, I started to understand him better. But, um, you know, I, I, what we have to do is we have to study the Bible, right? When, when people use all of these periphery types of arguments or types of evidence, and they don't address the scriptural evidence, when they, you know, claim that, you know, the person who is is disagreeing with them is obviously got a problem, it's not useful. It's not a health, helpful argument. So I, I wouldn't see what would be the point of attacking David H. Steele, uh, for instance. Why would I attack him? We have the scriptures. I'm only interested in what the scriptures say. The reason we're reading his paper is He's presented some arguments that are very common arguments and that we have to address. So I, I can't see how that is possibly an attack upon a person. But um, anyway, we're, we're, we're going to go back into this paper. We're going to continue dealing with the arguments that he makes. And um, and we're going to show why they're faulty arguments. Right now, I do believe he makes emotional arguments as well and i do believe he shows a bias on how he looks at things now maybe he takes that as an attack upon his character but if it's an emotional argument you you can show that it's an emotional argument or if it's in a bias you can show that it's a bias uh, is is that attacking a person M maybe maybe he takes it that it is i don't see that it's attacking a person okay yeah i don't well I mean, here, here's the thing. If I, dis if I disagree with something you've written, yeah. and I say that the position is poorly explained, am I attacking you? Well, no, 
But you, a, a person may take it as an attack because, oh, you think I explained things poorly. Okay, so <laughs> on the other on the other side, if I was to say, I don't like what what you've written because you dress funny. Yeah, or you know you're you, you know you're arrogant or you're a jerk or right. You know, yeah. So there is a difference. Mm -hmm. I don't see that any of us have attacked David H. Thiel. I have seen that we don't fully agree with the points that he is making, but we are trying to understand the position that he is presenting, whether we agree with him or whether we do not. Yeah, and we're not trying to mind read either. Right. Which he tends to do. Now, he could take that as an attack again. But we can see he's he's impugning motives that are not explicitly stated either by James White or Louis F. Weir. And and he's imputing these, these motives based upon a very unlikely, in my view, uh, scenario of hurt feelings. So hurt feelings has caused Louis F. Weir to take this view on, on Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. It doesn't make any sense to me, right? I don't think it's a reasonable uh, hypothesis, right? There's no evidence for it. I mean, you might say there's a correlation. You know, he, he had his feelings hurt, but we don't even know how hurt his feelings were. We don't even know what his his emotional response was to how he was treated. You know, he hasn't presented any evidence to show that that Weir was bitter about what happened or anything, right? He obviously maintained his relationship with the Seventh-day Adventist Church, continued to be an Adventist, so he didn't end up with some kind of offshoot or somebody attacking the church. He just simply seems like a Bible student who who disagreed with Uriah Smith, doesn't appear to have anything to do with what happened to him personally, right? And, and so when we do that, when we try to say, well, what is the motive for this person having this opinion? That, that's kind of a shaky ground. I mean, there are times when, when motives can be quite clear. One is a person may tell us <laughs> what their motives are. Uh, sometimes we may have like personal knowledge of that person. Uh, you know, we know them quite well. We know how they have reacted in different situations. We know that they're emotional about something. And so we can we can say, well, here is why, you know, they took this position or whatever. But but the best way to deal with with something is to look at the evidence from the scriptures themselves. Now, now, Theo has also put us in this sort of I'll say it's a box. And that is he's he set up Miller's rules against Weir's rules. Right. So his argument is that Lewis F. Weir has this new hermeneutic that has destroyed Adventism. Right. And uh, that Smith is using Miller's rules. Well, we've we've spent time going through Miller's rules and showing where Smith departs from Miller's rules. Right. So it, you know, it's quite clear that people can believe in a set of rules, but they don't necessarily always follow them. Miller doesn't even always follow his own rules. It's not just that Miller, you know, couldn't see certain things. I mean, it's sort of true. But if he had followed his rules, he wouldn't have come up with the idea that the earth is the sanctuary. But it's just an assumption he made that he never examined, right? That the earth was the sanctuary to be cleansed by fire, right? It, it just, it was just sometimes there are things that we just don't examine. We have premises that we don't uh, consider. Is this true or not? So we don't always follow our own rules. And of course, the most important rule is is obedience. And, and sometimes, you know, we don't walk in the light that God has given us. And so he doesn't give us more light, right? It's simple as that. There's limitations uh, to humanity. The, having the proper hermeneutic isn't going to necessarily bring you um, at any point to the understanding of all truth. It's not going to make you free from error in all of your thinking, you know, at, 
I mean, maybe at some point, we know in the future, we will be uh, understanding things more clearly. But obviously, there's a process of time in which we study. So even if I'm following the correct hermeneutic, I still am going to have things that need to be corrected all the time, right? Now, we also make an argument that, that Smith has this dependence upon Protestant commentators. Nothing wrong with looking in a commentary to get some background information, to find references, because if you look in a commentary, sometimes they'll direct you to certain verses because they're studying the Bible too, right? Um, but when I take the opinion of a commentator and say, well, because this commentator or this lexographer uh, has the, draws this conclusion, it must evidently be the correct conclusion, that's not following Miller's rules, right? Did I, did I hear you correctly that Thiel is commenting about Smith's use of commentators? No, no. Did, did you mean Miller's? No. Um, well, no, no, Smith's use of commentators. Okay. But Thiel didn't comment about it. Uh, okay. he, he was commenting on the fact that he was using Miller's rules, and I'm saying that where he de where Smith departed from Miller's rules was in, in using commentators, because Miller is quite clear that the opinion of, of some commentator doesn't mean anything, right, in and of itself. Where Smith tends to, as we've shown many times, he 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 has a conclusion. He finds a commentator that agrees with him. Sometimes they don't, but you know he makes them agree with him, and says it must evidently be true since this guy said it. Right? We sh we've shown that many times with Smith. That's not Miller's rules. Right. <laughs> right. So, so we've shown where Smith has departed from Miller's rules and where he has this dependence upon Protestant uh, uh, commentators. And really, this, this appeal to authority is a Protestant means of study that comes from the papacy. In a sense, appeal to authority in this sense is like an appeal uh, to tradition, right? The Jews had the same kind of idea when they would appeal to the rabbis you know this rabbi says this now that's different than appealing to the word of god because the word of god is the standard by which everything should be tested and of course we include the spirit of prophecy in that context as god's word and ellen white makes a statement regarding uh the bible we don't just take it as her opinion right okay so so when we follow these rules, when we looked at the rules of, and we didn't look at all the rules um, in detail, but we looked at the idea that everything in the scripture must represent Christ, that there is, the, that you can't just study the scriptures based upon what it says on the surface. But as you go deeper, it's not going to contrast or conflict with the plain statements of scripture, right? So one of the things that Thiel has done is he, he showed where, where Weir is, is saying that the gathering to the Battle of Armageddon begins before the close of probation. And, and he believes that that discredits Louis F. Weir because of the plain statement says that the gathering happens during the sixth plague, which is after the close of probation. But just reading the context, it's pretty clear that if you have them gather together, that that gathering is involved in the choices that are being made prior to the close of probation, correct? Right. Yeah. So in order to be gathered, you know, the wicked to be gathered, you know, the dragon, the beast and the false prophet and all those um, gathered together at Armageddon, we would know that obviously probation is closed. People have made their decisions. So that's all Lewis F. Weir is saying. He's not saying that, you know, the sixth plague begins before the close of probation or anything like that. No, no, Theo, you know, and I've asked him the question. He hasn't really answered it. But uh, 
you know, I would think that he must take the position that the Battle of Armageddon is a literal battle between nations, right? So it's one thing to argue that the book of Daniel is a literal prophecy from the beginning to the end, which I think is a false premise. Theo has said it in, in you know, and, I, and I'm saying, well, you make this statement, you don't give any evidence to it. It's just an assertion. But we have in the book of Revelation definitely a prophet, prophecies that are written in symbolic language. We don't take the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet to be literal. We believe them to be symbols. And the most consistent thing would be to take um, Daniel chapter 11 and recognize when we're dealing with the final passages that they're dealing with the church and not with Israel. Right? Okay. If we're talking about the glorious land at the end of the world, is that Palestine? No. It, it can't be, right? Now, no way. So, Thiel, so Thiel and Smith are taking the view that it is, right? That it's a literal prophecy. So that means when it comes to Daniel chapter 11, we have to take when it talks about Palestine, right? The, the glorious land that it has to literally be Palestine at the end of the world. But in the book of Revelation, uh, we shouldn't have that because literal Israel has no part to play in end time prophecy. Right? Correct. If you're going to take the position that they do, then you would have to say that Ellen White is wrong when she says that they don't. <laughs> okay? So to me, to follow Miller's rules, it, you can't just follow them sometime and, and, and ignore them at other times. You have to bring everything together. And so we understand, yes, Daniel 11 is, is a very direct prophecy. It doesn't use as much symbols. It's not written in apocalyptic language with beasts representing kingdoms or, uh, you know, a statue representing kingdoms or things like that. It's, it's more direct. But that doesn't mean it doesn't move from literal to spiritual. It doesn't move from, uh, you know, earthly to heavenly. Right. It, 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 it doesn't make sense to me, you know, that argument that Smith uses. And but if if you are going to take that position, then you have to start taking what I would call the futurist position. Uh, the idea that we can look at, at the book of Revelation. And when it talks about Babylon, we have to think, well, that's Iraq, right? When it talks about uh, the Jews, you know, the 144,000, they would have to be literal Jews, right? Like you can't have your cake and eat it too. You have to be consistent. Okay. <clears throat> so we're just going to finish off this here. Go back to this about the principles, Weir's principles. So, um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll read these, this paragraph here. Though Ellen White only lists about one third of the rules, the omission of the others does not mean that she had rejected or changed them any more than Jesus rejected or changed the moral law when he spoke only a partial listing of the Ten Commandments of the rich young ruler. Right. Plus, she says there are more rules. She intended in 1884 that the same principle used, principles used in 1844, 40 years earlier, uh, were just as valid. And while in Australia praying that God would make the truth plain, she gives strong indication that Elder Daniels had submitted to the same plan that Father Miller adopted. As we compare and contrast the plans, the rules, the principles adopted by Miller and Weir, can it be said that Lewis Weir is adhering to the same plan as Miller, or has he adopt, adopted a different scheme? It appears that while claiming honesty and shoring up his principles and laws of interpretation of the scripture and spirit of prophecy, we are ignoring the plain utterances of the word of God. And I don't see any evidence that that is the case. Right. So he, he's going to give the one example. Right. That one example has to do with his misrepresentation of Lewis F. Weir's view about the gathering at Armageddon. And so he's going to say he ignores plain utterances of the word of God. And so he has a different scheme. 
Now it goes on, one may make diligent study and attempt to categorize Weir's list of principles with the label of each of Miller's rules. However, many of Weir's principles or laws are so distinctly of a figurative nature where scripture and spirit of prophecy are spiritualized. When in actuality, the Bible and Ellen White's uh, writings are literal and should be understood as such, that one might well become concerned with the mystic influence of such an application. Now, well, well, I'll finish the paragraph and then we'll comment. The mystic approach tends to give Weir permission to reason in such a manner as to dismiss the important insights provided by a literal interpretation. Weir asks, how does the interpretation that Revelation 16, verse 12 to 16, envisages a military war reveal Christ? Uh, while giving the appearance of adhering to his own rule, he forgets that Jesus said, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not a not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Behold, I have told you before. Also, we must acknowledge that the Bible reveals Christ, not only as infinite love, but also infinite justice. So this, this paragraph is particularly troublesome. Okay. So one is he's, he's taking this statement of Weir's out of context. So what, what is Revelation 16, verse 12 to 16? So let's take a look at that. I mean, we know what it is, but why why would Weir say what he says about this? So this is the sixth plague. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, Louis F. Weir writes a paper, The Kings from the Sun Rising. He shows that this uh, the kings of the east here is Christ. Right. This is the second coming that's being talked about. Now, and that the river Euphrates should not be understood literally. OK, so I believe that Theo believes that that this river Euphrates will actually dry up and that that's a sign. Now, I know people who are looking at the river Euphrates drying up presently because there are times that it dries up because of uh, irrigation, you know, taking water from the Euphrates, it's not really dried up completely, but. But of course, this is before the close of probation, so it doesn't really make sense. But we know that the three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Are we to take that literally? No. No? Yeah. We don't believe that there are going to be unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of a dragon or a beast or a false prophet. We understand that these are symbols. Right? This happens to the sixth plague. Yes, they are symbols. Because uh, to speak or coming out of the mouth, it's, uh, it's to do with the law. Yes. I, uh, the, yeah, I heard it does violence to nature. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, the mouth represents uh, uh, laws, decrees, legislation. Okay. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Now, if this battle that's being talked about is a battle between nations and, and, and nations, particularly Palestine and the nations surrounding it, uh, this would be something that would happen after the close of probation. If, as a Seventh-day Adventist, we believe the plagues are after the close of probation. Theo believes that. So he, he's going to argue, it appears to me, that, that this is, the drying up of the river Euphrates is a literal thing, not symbolic, right? Because we had the river Euphrates dried up with the fall of literal Babylon in 539. And we're dealing here with spiritual Babylon, right? So we can see how the river Euphrates would be a symbol. Is that Does that make it mystical? Is it a mystical interpretation to say that this battle is not literal, battle between nations especially when we read the language here would we take this as a literal battle battle of armageddon no. some literal battle no no it, it would make no sense it would be inconsistent in studying revelation to take the river euphrates drying up as literally referring to the river euphrates drying up we have all kinds of symbols being used here because if we did that, we would have to say that the frogs are literal 
and the dragon is literal, and the beast is literal. I heard this year argument was a Seventh Day Adventist a website called Seventh Day Press. I think they're based in Canada, and they um, had this year argument as well that it's a literal river Euphrates. Mm-hmm. I think they actually actually made it um, an application that it refers to Turkey because the river Euphrates is uh, begins in Turkey. Yeah. But they always they also said, well, we're using William Miller's rules and so forth. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to use William Miller's rules, you're going to have to proof text. And you look at uh, the river Euphrates and you can sort of see that it was straight up uh, by the by Cyrus and his armies, but not mm-hmm. once, not once, even though they claim to be using William Miller's rules, not once in their argument in their presentation that they actually refer to Cyrus and wherever you're afraid he's drying up. Mm-hmm. So um, it was re- really terrible interpretation of prophecy. They really uh, the, the lack of spiritual understanding of interpreting. Well, uh, prophecy was just like I was kind of bewildered that there was Adventists who could uh, buy into that. Yeah. So, yeah. So you're using uh, uh, a logical fallacy there, which is uh, where you say you're bewildered. So that's uh, a logical fallacy. But anyway, <laughs> the reality, I mean, I agree with you. It, it, it is amazing that people can, can, and, and this is the thing that I found interesting. I, the first time I ever had somebody who began a study talking about Miller's rules was uh, we had a, a pastor who uh, believed that uh, the seven heads of the Beast of Revelation 17 were seven popes. And um, but the next pope, because at that time, Pope John Paul was still around. The next pope was going to be the Antichrist. And and so he did probably about a two hour study first on Miller's rules. Uh, the study went the entire day. So he started, you know, with the sermon and uh, the study went through till about five in the afternoon or something like that. I left, I think, at four o'clock. Uh, so I missed the last hour of the study because um, I was hungry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, so, you know, he skipped lunch, everything. But uh, the point is, often people will appeal to Miller's rules prior to not using them. And that's type, a type of deflection. There's a time, you know, we can appeal to Miller's rules it, in a particular point. They're saying, here we are making this argument, and here is how this, uh, uh, this is the rule that we're using in Miller's rules. But when people primarily suggest that because they say they're using Miller's rules, we must accept their conclusion. Uh, that's that's just a deflection, as far as I'm concerned, right? It's it's a way of 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 not actually addressing Miller's rules at all. So so yeah, it, it to me it's pretty hard to take this um, because we're going to be dealing with Babylon as well, right? And uh, and we're not going to take Babylon literally. We're going to take Babylon to represent the world, this religious system. So when spiritual Babylon falls, it's understanding that the river that dries up is the spiritual river, Euphrates. And it's a symbol that parallels what happened with the fall of literal Babylon. Right Now, in the story of the river Euphrates drying up, uh, the kings of the east that come and address the fall of Babylon are Cyrus and Darius, right? The, that the fall of Babylon, yes. Cyrus and Darius are Cyrus. Okay. Now, Cyrus is the Lord's anointed. He's, he's the Messiah, right? Correct? That's correct. So the kings of the east here must refer to to Christ's kingdom, not to people from, uh, you know, uh, the Arab countries. I agree. This this isn't Islam coming. They're not the kings of the East. Now, we know that we also have North and East um, 
So we have north and east in the literal aspect at times. And and so when, when we have a king of the north, we know that that's going to be Babylon and Assyria that come from the north. But we see that this deliverance from Babylonian captivity comes from the east. That is from that area where, you know, eventually Islam is going to come from. So we can see here at the end of the world, we would have to understand those things as being typical, that this they're symbolic of something that's happening. So the kings that come from the east or from the sun rising, uh, this would be a reference to the coming of Christ. So we have the drying up the great river Euphrates, which prepares the second coming of Christ. And Satan's final desperate act, um, if you read the, the time of trouble in the great controversy, um, you would see that this is going to be the time of Jacob. Jacob's trouble that's being described here in Revelation 16, uh, verse 12 uh, to 16. And uh, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So these words of Christ um, that are, are in red here. So we take them as the words of Christ. Because Christ, behold, I come as a thief. So that must be Christ speaking, Jesus speaking. This would be a message to the 144,000 during the time of Jacob's trouble. This is words of encouragement to that group of people. We need to watch and keep our garments. Now, it doesn't just apply then. It applies now, right? Because right now we have to watch and keep our garments, right? So, So this is a warning but it's also words of encouragement, right? And so when he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon, we know that um, there is no place called the mountain of Megiddo, which is what Armageddon means. At least that's one interpretation. There's the valley of Megiddo, but we don't have the mountain of Megiddo. So the idea here is that it's symbolic. Uh, Would that not be a reference to Mount Carmel? Yeah, some people say that. So it could be, right? But but there is no place called the mountain of Megiddo. So some people just say that it's it's built in to be a symbol of something, you know, of this of this struggle, of this battle, um, which is a an internal battle. So what? What um, Thiel is trying to argue is that this is mis- mystical interpretation. Now, of course, he throws the word mystical in there uh, because once you put in mystical or spiritualized, like if we just said it's it's symbolic, he's taking it as a symbol, it wouldn't be quite as offensive. So he says, you know, however many of Weir's principles or laws are so distinctly of a figurative nature where scripture and spirit of prophecy are spiritualized, so he's going to say and he's, they're not just types or symbols, but they're spiritualized, right? So that that kind of can have a bad connotation. But spiritualized by itself just means figurative. <laughs> when in actuality, the Bible and Ellen White's writings are literal and should be understood as such. Now, is the Bible always literal? Is, is this Miller's rule say that we always take the Bible as literal, always? No. It's it's only when only to... when it makes sense. Yeah, we take it as literal unless it's sure, unless it's obvious that a figure is being used, right? Right, so we do take the Bible as literal. We don't just take it as an allegory, right? That's basically what Miller is saying when it talks about the creation of the world. There's no reason to take that as some kind of allegory. It, we're, we're going to take it literal. The, the literal makes sense. But we do understand that there are symbolic aspects, even to literal stories, right? That, that they are, in a sense, typical. All these things that were written aforehand were written as in samples, right? That is typos, types, figures. So even though they're literal things, they also can be figurative. But we know that there are times that things are are just figures. The book of Revelation is written in figures, in symbols. 
So even when we see these sins in heaven, we see Christ standing in the midst of the golden candlesticks. I mean, we know Christ is ministering in heaven, right? But we know that there is not necessarily golden candlesticks with wax candles or, you know, like some people depict it, or oil being burnt, you know, literal olive oil being burnt uh, to bring light into the sanctuary in heaven, right? There definitely isn't curtains with angels embroidered on them, right? There's curtains of angels, right? So we understand that, that the earthly sanctuary is is a figure of what is actually in heaven, right? That is, it's, and so when we use the earthly language to describe what's in heaven, that it's obviously heaven is much greater than that. But it doesn't deny the fact that there is a holy place and a most holy place ministry and that those, that those exist in some way, just not in a way that we could necessarily represent uh, in, in language, right? So, so we don't really believe that there is lampstands in heaven, that God made some lampstands and put them there in a sanctuary in heaven. Now, I know some people who believe that there must be, because that's what Ellen White saw in vision. But is Jesus a lamb that has seven horns and seven eyes? If we see a lamb slain in the sanctuary in heaven, is that actually, uh, is there a lamb in heaven that's been slain? You understand the question? I think most people would probably say no. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, um, you know, so so we know that Ellen White saw things in vision that are symbolic. It doesn't mean that they were literally, that's what she sees in vision. What a prophet sees in vision is not actual. But some people do take things more literal, right? So uh, I think Ellen White sees like a lamb tied to a, uh, a pillar or something like that, that there must actually be a lamb tied to a pillar that's, you know, slain, something to that effect. I can't remember exactly. I might be getting that mixed up. But but you understand what I'm saying? I mean, I know people personally that believe there, there is a sanctuary in heaven that looks like the one that was made on earth, the tabernacle. And that if you don't believe that, then you you are going to be lost. I know people who believe that, right? I don't. I don't believe that there's a literal sanctuary with, you know, curtains and so forth in that sense that looks like the one on earth. So maybe, you know, in that case, I, I don't know what Theo thinks about that, but maybe he thinks that's mysticism or spiritualizing, right? So he says, uh, the mystic approach tends to give we are permission to reason in such a manner as to dismiss important insights provided by a literal interpretation. Now, I don't know about any important insights that a literal interpretation gives us, other than if you believe that Turkey is going to be uh, involved in end time events, as Theo suggests. So when we are asked this question about Revelation 16, verse 12 to 16, obviously, the fact that we hear of wars and rumors of wars is not really answering the question that we are is asking. Because this is not those things that are wars and rumors of wars that are sort of signs that Christ is coming. This is actually after the close of probation this battle of Armageddon. It's not a sign of Christ's coming in the sense that these others' wars and rumors of wars are. So, and when he says, also we must acknowledge that the Bible reveals Christ, not only as infinite love, but also infinite justice. Well, where, when is this justice met? Is it, I'm not sure how the battle of Armageddon uh, would uh, address the issue of infinite justice because it would be a battle between nations, right? In, in my understanding of how Smith looked at it and how Theo would be looking at it, where is into infinite justice satisfied uh, in, in the line of the Bible prophecy? Not, not the battle of Armageddon, right? 
uh, would be like the destruction of the wicked at the end of the world when they gather around the city. Now, that's not the Battle of Armageddon, right? After the thousand years? Of the Gog and Magog. Yeah, so that's a totally different battle. But even then, it's presented in symbolic language, right? It is. Yeah. Okay. So um, now, see here is he says we have already we have read we already have read how Lewis F. Weir places the seven last plagues as happening before the close of probation. Now, does Lewis F. Weir place the seven last plagues as happening before the close of probation? No. No, definitely he does not. <laughs> so we we know that's not the case. But he, he makes him say that by claiming that the gathering of Armageddon commences before the close of probation. We looked at that statement. And of course, that's not what Lewis F. Weir is saying. He's not saying that, that since the gathering of Armageddon, that is, people making their decisions happens before the close of probation, means that the seven last plagues must happen before the close of probation. So that misreading of Weir is, is troublesome. Right. The decisions made before probation closes will determine whether or not we shall be destroyed in Armageddon. Right. So saying that the gathering of Armageddon commences before probation closes doesn't mean that the seven last plagues occur before close, probation closes, as Thiel is trying to say. So it's pretty clear. Louis F. Weir does not believe that the plagues happened before the close of probation. So, I mean, I'm not sure how, you know, like Weir doesn't say that, how Thiel can get him to say that is really a stretch. And by this reasoning alone, promoting a figurative mystical rendering to a literal plain passage of scripture. This conclusion contradicts what Ellen White wrote. It also overlooks what else Ellen White wrote about the revelation of Christ as it relates to the infinite justice of God. Now, because he's starting here with a completely false statement about what Weir teaches, it obviously doesn't contradict what Ellen White wrote. And so it's sort of irrelevant uh, for him to make this argument and to give these quotes. But, but because they're consistent with what Weir says, they're not a contradiction. Now, the thing that I, I never like when I'm in a discussion with someone is that if I say something that a person disagrees with, one way to, that, that we can attack what a person says is to say, if you say that, you must also mean this. Have you ever run into that situation? I'm sure you all have, right? You say something, well, a, a classic one for Adventists, I believe that Saturday is the Sabbath. Well, so that means that you believe that uh, we're saved by works, right? So, so that person says, if you believe that, then you believe in salvation by works. That they can't, they can't um, accept the idea of Saturday being the Sabbath and that we have to keep the Sabbath as being consistent with righteousness by faith, right? If you believe in the Sabbath, you believe in salvation by works. And of course, we don't, right? Another one is, oh, if you say the, the scapegoat is Satan, then you're saying that Satan is our savior, right? So people will say, if you say this, then you must mean this. And, and no matter how much you object to the idea that Satan is your savior, the fact that you uh, say that the, the scapegoat is Satan, and that the sins of the righteous are going to be confessed upon the head of the scapegoat, which is Satan, that means Satan is your sin bearer, right? So maybe you've run into people who make that argument. And they can never allow you any sort of explanation of it. it, it it's extremely frustrating when people do that. Now, now what's, what's the problem with it? What, what kind of, what, what's the problem with that type of argument? Is it like a bait and switch or something? Or? Yeah, it, well, a it, it bait and switch, it's a straw man argument, right? 
It's yeah. right. You're you're not saying something, and they they say, well, if you say this, you must be saying this. And and this is sort of where Thiel is is placing Louis F. Weir, right? He's saying another one. Another one comes to mind is. If you say that Christ is Michael the Archangel, that you're mm-hmm. saying Christ is an angel, and not yeah, that he's so, that he must be a created being, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's lots of things like that, and 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 so one thing that we need to be careful when we're discussing with people is is putting words into their mouth or imputing uh, beliefs based upon what we think. The, would be what they're saying, even if they're not saying. We need to understand their reasons for for what they're saying, right? If we ignore their reasoning, uh, it's not really fair. It's not fair argument. If a brother differs, you know, you, you, you can't make him out to be a heretic, right? All those things. You can't take his words out of their context. You can't force upon them a meaning that the person doesn't intend. It's not, it's not honest discussion. And, and so that would be a problem I have here with, with what Thiel is doing, is he's using straw man, straw man, a straw man here in this case, um, to discredit Lewis F. Weir instead of looking at all of the evidences, right, and trying to weigh them. Now, sure, there is a difference. Um, a basic, you know, say philosophical difference on how they decide uh, to understand symbols. But he's not he's not going through and showing how we should understand uh, some things literally. He says we we just accept the Bible literally, which we know is not the case. That's not one of Will and Miller's rules. Yes, we do accept it literally when it's obvious it's literal. But when it's it's pretty obvious that it's not literal, then we understand that a type or a symbol is being used, that it's figurative language. And definitely revelation is figurative language because it tells us it is, shows it all the way through. So there's going to be these uh, quotes from Ellen White, which I don't think are relevant. They're not going to address uh, any of anything relevant. So in the years leading up to the Great Disappointment, opposition to the rules of interpretation used by William Miller became more intense. The Millerites noted the growing trend in changes to Bible interpretation by the nominal denominations as the clergy resisted the Millerite message of the imminent second coming of Christ and threw their time and energy toward influencing their parishes to accept new theology, making gains among them. So we're going to Read this here. This quote is a Damstead, Foundations of the Seventh day Adventist Message, Movement and Message. Okay, in 1844, due to growing opposition and polarization of positions between Millerites and other Christians, various Millerites associated the above described historical critical trends with the term neology, as other evangelical Christians had done before. Now, um, so we're a little bit out of context here. Anybody know what neology is? Never heard the term before other than here. Is that new thinking? Well, that's what literally, yeah. So neology, the study of new things, was the name given to the rationalist theology of Germany or the rationalization of the Christian religion. It was preceded by slightly less radical wolfism. Okay, Chambers English Dictionary of 1872 adds the application of this term specifically to new theological doctrines, especially those arising from German rationalism, which have, which would have been those who have deprecated them, which would have been by those who deprecated them, that is, opposed them or spoke badly in, regarding them. The Swedish Encyclopedia defines neology as a type of Protestant theology during the second half of the 18th century, to a large extent formed by ideas of the Enlightenment, including British deism. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, neology was based on the downplaying of revelation, fulfillment of biblical prophecies and miracles in favor of reason as the most important tool for understanding God. Um, so Christian Wolf was one of the figures. 
uh, Johann Salomo Selmer, and uh, he dominated Lutheranism during the late 18th century. Okay, so there, we know everything about neologism that there is to know. <laughs> okay, so 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 this is a historical critical trend that was happening. So these are these are the German rationalists regarding the views of Stuart and Chase. Millerites remarked that one of the most alarming features of the present state of the churches is the railroad speed with which many of the most prominent divines are leaving the old landmarks and taking neological ground. Culver and Dowling were also accused of neology. According to Nathan and Whitting, uh, Doctor of Divinity, um, a Baptist scholar, Millerite lecturer, and editor. Not sure why we got four or five and then seven, but anyway. Um, the term neology would be equated with rationalism and had once been applied to the actual creed of a large portion of the members of the German church um, who profess a nominal adhesion to the Augsburg Confession of Faith while they reject its fundamental principles and maintain positions in contradiction to it. Now, the term was described as new theology departing from the old established principles of biblical interpretation and leaving the faith once delivered to the saints for new doctrine, which had adopted views on the prophecies in accordance with the philosophies of Germany and France. It is evident that the Millerites had no sympathy with the hermeneutics employed by those who tended towards historical criticism. Okay, so so I'm not sure what he's trying to set up here, but Thiel is talking about this opposition that happened with this German rationalism as opposing them. Um, Joshua Himes would have taken issue with Weir's objection on grounds of arbitrary hermeneutics and present as a counter argument the Miller position on neology for the figurative, spiritualistic and mystic approach as part and parcel of neology. Wow. OK. Now, is this ever a leap? <laughs> so I thought he might go this direction. So um, so what is he saying about Weir? Is there any connection new, between Lewis F. Weir and neology? He's he's saying about Weir that he's bringing in new theology. Yes, and he's saying that it's neology, right? Now, of course, he's taking this definition here, departing from the old established principles of biblical interpretation and leaving the faith once delivered to the saints for new doctrine. Now, Weir is not in any sense doing that, right? So this is sort of a, a type of, um, oh, it's a fancy way of name calling, right, here. So so for, for a reader who's reading this paper that Thiel is writing, who doesn't really understand Weir very well, has, hasn't really studied Weir's papers, doesn't understand um, Millerite history and the context in which this statement is being made by Damsty, because um, this is just talking about the opposition. Now, when he says Joshua Himes would have taken issue with Rear's objection on grounds of arbitrary hermeneutics and present a counter argument um, as a counter argument, Millerite position on neology. Uh, is there any evidence that Joshua Himes would have done this? I'm not aware of Joshua Himes addressing anything of uh, <laughs> related to Daniel Lavo. Yeah, I yeah, me neither. But but also, <laughs> would Joshua Himes have, have accused Weir of neology? Did it exist in time, Himes' day? Well, yeah, it, it did in the later part of the 18th century and that or the mid because it, it, it was something that they addressed because basically it was German rationalism. One of the things that people did in opposition to the Millerite movement is because of German rationalism that was brought uh, by some of the, their opponents as arguments against Millerite understanding. But there's no way that you could class Weir with German rationalism. Like, there's just no connection, like, from a basic philosophical point of view or in any other way. Now, what he's trying to say is that, well, neology uses figurative, spiritualistic, and mystic approach, that it's a part and parcel of neology. 
Now, that's a complete misrepresentation. What does what do the rationalists do? They basically say the Bible is a myth. Right. It, it, yeah. it's, it's, right. So <laughs> is in any way Louis F. Weir using the Bible in this way? No, not at all. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> You know, I, I use this as an illustration sometimes when, when somebody says that something's pagan. You know, I say, did you know pagans use the first ones to use forks? So if you're using a fork, are you a pagan? Right. Just because there are some things that neologists use, like figures and types, does it mean that everyone who uses a figure or a type is a neologist? Because that would make Miller a neologist. Now, of course, figurative, spiritualistic, and mystic. I mean, definitely, I would not classify Weir as mystical in that sort of, you know, connotation that we have with mysticism, right? Weir is not a mystic. Now, spiritual, spiritual is just another word for figurative, but spiritualistic can have negative connotations as well. So, so he hasn't proved that we are is spiritualistic or mystic. That he does use figurative, that he recognizes figurative language in the Bible. Yes. Okay. So here, and it goes on here. It begins with denying the literal rendering of the word and ends with the denial of the inspiration of the scriptures. Now, obviously, Weir does not do that. We accordingly find men in the church in every stage of progress from the most incipient, incipient germ to the boldest skepticism. It is manifested in some by a denial of the literal application of all those passages of scripture which relate to the coming of Christ and the end of the world. So when they don't believe in a literal application, they mean that Jesus is not literally going to return. So I grew up with this. My dad did not believe in the literal coming of Christ. He believed that Christ is within you, right? That the kingdom of God is within you, right? That would be this type of rejection of the literal application of the second coming of Christ. Is we are in any way in sympathy with any of these ideas? No. No. No, right? So, so this is, is, is a misuse of language to paint Mir or paint Weir into a corner that, that he isn't in, right? So, in other words, the fourth beast of Daniel is made to symbolize the divided Grecian kingdom and its little horn and Tychus epiphanies, the pro, right? Which is preterism. The prophetic time being confined to them to literal days and the judgment seen in Daniel um, uh, 7 and the resurrection of Daniel 12 being carried back to the death of Atticus. While therefore we speak of the neological view of the church, we include all the various phases that this doctrine assumes. Individuals being more or less neological as they depart from literal scriptures and forsake the old established principles of interpretation, which the Boston Recorder acknowledges are the foundation of Millerism. So he's trying to paint Weir into this box, which Weir doesn't belong in. That is, Weir does not reject the understanding of Daniel as referring to end time events. He doesn't try to relegate Daniel to events that had already occurred, right? So it's completely unfair. Like it's, it's a complete misrepresentation of what we're is teaching or believes it, it's it's really not a fair uh assessment of we and it's definitely going to mislead anybody reading this paper as to what we are believes right ellen white has warned us that the same history experienced by the millerites would occur once once again occur she also assures us that what is as yet unfulfilled will indeed happen at the right time what we are experiencing is a conflict between truth and error. What we ought to be doing is strengthening faith that the prophecy will be fulfilled in its proper time, in its proper order, even as we cooperate with God in the work of fitting our characters for heaven. Now, so what Thiel is, is saying, his basic premise is that Lewis F. Weir 
because of his spiritualistic and mystical interpretations of scripture, open the door for all of this new interpretation of prophecy that occurs within Adventism. So he opened the door for people like uh, Anderson and um, and Ford and uh, et cetera, right? And then all of these other sort of, um, you know, stuff that you see in the Spectrum, in Spectrum magazine. Is, is there is there any truth to this? Or does it have some other origin? Now, I, I would say that, you know, the German rationalism definitely does affect those ideas within Adventism because they affected the Protestants. I would imagine, we, what's that, Stephen? I would imagine that the uh, spectrum and so forth would not have been supportive of where of where and his uh, understanding of theology and prophecy. Yeah. So so Lewis F. Weir, I mean, he fits in with the way that we understand things. Now, I'm not really sure what Theo thinks about us. I mean, I don't know if he spent any time looking at how we understand prophecy or whatever. But we definitely are not in the in the new theology camp. Right. And, and so what I think Theo believes from communicating with him, from reading his stuff, is that there is this this thing which we would call historic Adventism. And that it includes this idea that uh, thoughts on Daniel and thoughts on Revelation are basically inspired books that. Uh, um, and, and then he must think that people who don't accept that obviously are involved in the new theology. Right. That, that he's he's created this very black and white world. There's really just two two different ways of looking at at this issue. If you reject Smith, you're open to all this new theology, all these new interpretations of scripture. Now, the thing that I find, uh, you know, odd is that that the people who are accepting Smith right now people that I deal with, and maybe Stephen, you're dealing with some of these people too. I mean, they're departing from the spirit of prophecy, right? Many of them become anti-Trinitarians uh, and, and lots of other different sort of errors that they go back to, that they're, they're trying to become Millerites. And uh, it, it's not so black and white. It's not like just two different choices. There's lots of different uh, flavors that people have to choose from, depending upon their own personal temperaments or biases or groups that they want to belong to. So, so obviously we have the new theology of the church. We have uh, where where people like Desmond Ford, you know, who rejects the 2300 days and all the time prophecies. It still wants to be a Seventh Day Adventist. He's dead now. So, but you know, until he died, he still you know professed to believe in somewhat of Adventism. And many Adventists pastors that I know are in that line, right? They still want to be Seventh Day Adventists, even though they don't believe in the foundations of Adventism. And then you have all this this span of people with different varying views of accepting spirit of prophecy, varying views of of what prophecies they accept of the time prophecies, right? And and going all the way back to some who are you know not going to move anywhere beyond, you know, 1880, right, as far as what Seventh-day Adventists believe. Okay. Um, now, Stephen, you've been dealing with with people who have been supporting Uriah Smith's view and, and so forth. Do you have any, any thoughts about some of this? Yes. Um, so, yeah, there are, the, I was watching videos by uh, Seventh-day Press, and some people in the group, were saying it's nonsense, but there was a few sort of taking it very seriously. There may have been some differences between what they teach and what the L teaches, but mm -hmm. a lot of it uh, seems quite familiar. Mm -hmm. um, so I was responding sometimes to their uh, presentations online. Mm -hmm. and just um, really didn't get anywhere with them. You know, they didn't seem to be they just said this is the, their understanding. They were quite uh, firm on what they were uh, teaching. Yeah. Okay. Now, so so thanks for that. 
So when we look at these, these two paragraphs here from the Spirit of Prophecy, which we use all the time, all that God has in prophetic history specified to be fulfilled in the past has been, and all that is yet to come in its order will be. Daniel, God's prophet, stands in his place. John stands in his place. In the Revelation, the line of the tribe of Judah has opened to the students of prophecy the book of Daniel, and thus is Daniel standing in his place. He bears his testimony, that which the Lord revealed to him in vision of the great and solemn events, which we must know as we stand on the very threshold of their fulfillment. In history and prophecy, the word of God portrays the long-continued conflict between truth and error. That conflict is, conflict is yet in progress. Those things which have been will be repeated. Old controversies will be revived and new theories will be continually arising. But God's people, who in their belief and fulfillment of prophecy, have acted a part in the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages, know where they stand. They have an experience that is more precious than fine gold. They are to stand firm as a rock, holding and beginning of their confidence, steadfast unto the end. Now, in dealing with Theo, he doesn't really, I, like, I'm pretty sure he has no idea what I think about anything other than that he knows that I support uh, Weir's understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, to some degree, right? He doesn't know to what degree I agree with Weir or what degree I don't. Um, but he would see, because in, in his mind, he has framed Weir in this, as in opposition to this type of idea that we definitely support, Right. And I don't see Weir is in opposition to this. So, so he thinks that Weir has just said, we failed in our understanding of prophecy. Uriah Smith was wrong. So I need to have this new interpretation of prophecy. I got to find a new way to interpret prophecy. And, and those are the, basically the two things that Theo brings out is that because of his personal bitterness about how the church treated him and because the prophecy of Smith's predictions weren't fulfilled, that those are the two um, catalysts in we're developing this new theology, this new hermeneutic. And so that would somehow answer to the fact that the church mistreated him, and I'm not sure how that particularly would relate. And and then this rejection of Smith, um, which has opened the door to all this new stuff. So what Theo must think is, since I support Weir, that I, I there's a whole bunch of things I must believe that, it, you know, he hasn't he hasn't spent the time to actually figure out whether I believe those things or not. So that that's the only thing that I can can see at this point. <clears throat> so he goes on with the assurance that all prophecy that remains unfulfilled will be fulfilled in its proper order. We can persevere through troubling controversies, whether they be revived or, or new. So at this juncture, we may proceed with the objections raised, first by James White, then by Lewis Weir, regarding the fulfillment of Daniel 11 by the Ottoman Empire, that is Turkey. So James White lays the groundwork for future doubts by those who would look to circumstances that appear overwhelmingly impossible to finite minds and feel that what had been presented as fulfilled prophecy had turned to rot and worms and therefore must be false interpretation. He does this by using a line of reasoning that takes an extreme conclusion, forcing it upon the beliefs of those who would never accept such rationale. Here are the key paragraphs conveying White's main thrusts for overturning the conclusions of that group of Sabbath school participants used by Uriah Smith in Daniel and Revelation. And this was where we'll come to tomorrow. So one is, you know, as a criticism of Theo, just as, as a writer in the way that he uses language, um, it is highly polemical, which, which I'm not a fan of, right? Because we're not meant to, to, to bias the reader by our language. And, and, and we sometimes do that, but it, it's, it's not a good plan. One is, it, it, it's not going to help the person that we're trying to help, somebody that's uh, maybe leaning towards a believing a certain thing. It, it's a type of bullying as far as I'm concerned. So, so we need to be careful in how we do that. But, you know, it, 
I mean, Theo may think I'm bullying him by disagreeing with him. So you can't always avoid that. But, um, you know, he's putting Weir and James White in this sort of same box as uh, basically an error. And, and that's really another major problem. To, to, to say that since James White disagreed with Smith. Now, should James White have done it in the way that he did? You know, where, you know obviously, um, I don't know if it was, you know, that we'd have to examine that history a little bit more and what Ellen White says about it. But to say that James White was sort of on the wrong side of the issue, almost as an enemy of the gospel, I, I would have a hard time taking that position. Okay, so any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, well, let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study uh, here this morning. And for this new week, again, we ask that you can be with us as we continue to look at these things. Once again, we pray for David Thiel and his family. And um, we pray for one another. We know, Lord, that there's many struggles and trials we face. We know that uh, there's battles that need to be fought and that uh, will prepare us for a greater battles ahead. We thank you for your love and kindness that you show us and your mercy in giving us light and an opportunity to respond to it. So we just ask that your spirit can continue to work upon our hearts and that we can see our need of thee. Be with us throughout this day. And bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.